marketers are often interested in measuring a consumer's awareness of a brand, product, concept, service, experience, and so on. This is because marketers often think about a consumer's path to purchase as beginning with awareness. You may be familiar with the concept of the purchasing funnel. However, not all awareness is equally valued by marketers. For marketers, we usually think about consumer awareness in sort of three different uh, tiers. First, there's top of mind awareness. This is where there is no real external trigger, but rather it just emerges from someone's mind that they have familiarity with this. This is measured using what we call unaided recall measures. Next, some sort of contextual trigger in the environment or prompt from another individual or stimuli evokes someone's ability to recall and be aware of a phenomenon or thing. This is measured using what we call aided recall measures. And finally, sort of the lowest form of awareness is when we literally present someone with the exact stimuli that we're interested in as marketers, like an ad, a video, or a brand, or a product, and the individual then recalls seeing this in the past. So this is simple mere recognition of seeing this thing previously, and we measure that using what's called recognition measures. Let's illustrate these three different forms of awareness by way of example. Let's play a little game. What is the first brand that pops into your head? Don't second guess yourself. Whatever that brand was, just hold it in your mind right now. Now, was that brand Nike, Apple, Adidas, Coca-Cola, Google, or Amazon? It's very likely that it was one of these brands. According to the Student Monitor LLC report of 2018, when undergraduate college students in the United States were asked to recall from the top of their mind the first brand that pops into their head, it was one of these six brands. The example we just illustrated is what we might call a pure unaided awareness measure. Aside from prompting you to think about a brand, I provided absolutely no other contextual information whatsoever. Now typically, unaided awareness measures have a little more context provided to them. Uh, generally speaking, when they're used in marketing research, a broad product or industrial category is provided. For example, a question like, what is the first bank or financial service brand that pops into your mind? By the way, according to that same report, for undergraduate college students, 24% of them thought of Chase Bank. Now, take a moment to think about the last time you went shopping for groceries. See if you can imagine some of the different brand names you saw while you were actually at the grocery store. In the space below, list some of the brand names that you remember seeing. Now, what's different about this measure compared to the previous measure? It's clearly these first two sentences. Here, we're trying to help the individual put themselves back into the previous context of which we're trying to ask them to recall some information. Finally, here we see an example of a recognition measure. Have you ever seen this brand of food at a grocery store? And here, we're not providing any aid. We are literally providing an individual the exact stimuli and we're merely asking them, have you seen this thing before? Unfortunately, in practice, sometimes these recognition measures like this last one I just showed you, sometimes these are also called aided recall measures because there is an aid right here. However, I think it's useful to keep in mind that an aid is where you're helping someone along, like our second example, where our third example, a recognition measure, we are literally providing someone the exact stimuli and merely asking if they can see that, if they have seen that thing before. Marketing researchers often collect information about a consumer's knowledge as well. It's important to keep in mind that there's two types of knowledge that we're often interested in measuring, sometimes both or sometimes just one, depending on the particular situation. First, there's subjective knowledge. This is someone's belief about their level of knowledge about a topic. So this isn't actually what they know, it's how much they think they know. Objective knowledge is someone's actual demonstrable knowledge about a topic. It's important to separate these two concepts because these two things are rarely in alignment. What I'm showing you here is a chart that illustrates something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. This Dunning-Kruger effect is well known in social psychology and behavioral uh, economics. You see here, are two different lines. The dark line is, the, is how someone rated themselves on their perceived ability on a given test. The grade line here is how well that individual actually performed on that test. For example, what this chart is showing you is that for individuals who actually did very, very poorly on the test, so in other words, their objective knowledge was very low, those individuals tended to perceive themselves as being about average. That's what percentile performing about in the middle of the pack. So they guessed 
they knew about this much, but in reality, they only knew this much. And then after we see at the top end here, we also see a miscalibration of subjective and objective knowledge, but not quite as egregious. We see that those individuals who indeed actually knew a large amount only estimated themselves to perform slightly better than average. There's a lot of debate in the literature about what's driving the Dunning-Kruger effect or this mismatch between subjective and objective knowledge. For our purposes here, it's enough to say that there typically is a substantial difference between the two. So we as marketing researchers need to be very clear about which one we intend to measure because measuring one is unlikely to give us information about the other. Let's look at this example here related to craft beer. Look at these statements on the left hand side. We're asking a survey respondent to say how much they agree with the following statements. Now based on our previous conversation about knowledge, would this be a subjective knowledge measure or an objective knowledge measure with respect to craft beer? The answer would be subjective knowledge. We're asking the person to reflect on how much they believe they know. At no point here did we actually assess how much they actually know. If we wanted to measure objective knowledge about craft beer, we'd, we'd have a variety of different ways to do it. One way we might do it would be very similar to the same way that a professor tests you to demonstrate how much objective knowledge you have about a course topic. We'd give them a quiz. Here's a four question beer quiz. What are the traditional four main ingredients in beer? Do you know what the answer to this one is? Barley, yeast, water, and hops. If you got that correct, that would demonstrate some objective knowledge about beer. Why do marketers measure awareness and knowledge? Well, sometimes we track awareness longitudinally or over time to check, line, to check for baseline performance of our advertising campaigns. The only goal of advertising shouldn't simply be to create awareness, but it is a baseline goal. So we would expect to see over time that a aggressive, large spend advertising campaign should increase overall awareness about our product or brand. We may measure objective knowledge a consumer may have about our product, our service, or our brand because it can identify gaps between what the benefits are that our product offers and what people may actually be looking for. We may measure a consumer's objective knowledge because it may identify gaps between the benefits that our product offers versus what people actually understand about our product. An interesting example where understanding the differences in people's beliefs about their understanding of a product or brand and their actual knowledge about a product or brand can be found in the world of affiliate marketing. One of the most common forms of affiliate marketing we see today is where websites create articles, publications, and interesting content related to a product or brand, and then they provide links to purchasing that particular product or brand in question and gaining a percentage of the sale by doing so. In this affiliate marketing space, there's no shortage of examples of articles that feature hacking products or secret tips or ways to get more uses out of a particular product. These articles directly market on the premise that people may not fully understand what they can get out of the product, but by teaching and educating them what can actually be done, in other words, improving their objective knowledge about the product, it is actually a persuasive way to sell. These types of articles would be particularly effective in spaces where it is known that people's beliefs about the knowledge of a product is mismatched with their objective knowledge about a product. Personality refers to individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behavior. This word characteristic is very important when understanding what personality means. That's to say that although individuals may vary from day to day depending on context, mood, or particular situations, When we refer to someone's personality, we're referring to someone's general overarching way of being. Similarly, for lifestyle, we're referring to a particular way that someone lives, the way a person or group of people tend to live their lives. These are related concepts in marketing. Sometimes they even use these phrases interchangeably. However, in the world of marketing and marketing research, when we refer to personality, we tend to be focusing on the individual's state of mind, even though behaviors per their actual academic de definition can actually be part of someone's personality. While lifestyle, when we use this term in marketing, tends to emphasize actual marketplace behaviors, the things that people actually do out there in the world. With that said, when marketers use the word lifestyle, we are often talking about both marketplace behaviors as well as the way they are thinking and feeling.
Now, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of different personality traits that have been identified by psychologists, many of which have been proven to be useful for marketers for market segmentation, targeting, brand positioning purposes. However, if you took an introductory psychology course, you may remember there are the big five personality traits. And you'll remember that because the acronym OCEAN will come into your head. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Sometimes this phrase has been rebranded as emotional stability. These five personality traits are called the big five because they have shown to be very persistent and identified through a variety of different research studies. Some people even argue that all of the other personality traits are some mixture and derivative or second order, second order effect of these big five traits. But that's a debate for the academics, not one necessarily for the everyday applied marketing researcher. There's more than one way to measure how someone fares with respect to these five different personality traits. What I'm showing you here is a very short form 10 item scale, you can see how each one of these survey questions maps on to the five different personality traits. So if someone's actually taking the survey, they'll be asked the following question, how well do the following statements describe your personality? I see myself as someone who is reserved. And then as with all the other remaining statements, a Likert scale format is being presented where the person scores themselves from a one to five on each one of these questions. You may also notice that some of these questions are reverse coded. For example, look at the extroversion uh, question item one. So I see myself as someone who is reserved. Well, if someone is strongly extroverted, you would expect them to disagree strongly with this statement. On the other hand, I see myself as someone who is outgoing and sociable, the other extroversion measure, we would expect that individual to score a five here. And that's what it is to mean to be reverse coded. That is, we would to actually score this individual once we would flip these numbers and then score them together. Here's a simple visualization just illustrating how two different types of people may score on this 10 question personality inventory scale. We see that person A represented by the blue lines here scores very high in agreeableness and openness but relatively low on neuroticism and conscientiousness compared to person B who scores very high in neuroticism and very high in conscientiousness. Now, marketing researchers may often generate questionnaire items to categorize demographically similar consumers into distinct lifestyle categories. This is often the key purpose of, of, of measuring an individual's lifestyle when we collect this type of primary data. Let me give you an example of where we may as marketing researchers see value in generating a set of lifestyle-based uh, survey question items. According to the 2014 GFK University Reporter, 76.1% of male adults 18 to 34 have played a video game in the last 30 days. In other words, if you're a marketer of a particular type of video game looking to target this demographic group, it's not actually that helpful to know that male adults 18 to 34 play video games. In fact, over three quarters of them have played a video game in the last 30 days. Of course, that means not all of them are playing the same types of video games for the same reason or spending the same amount of money. So as a marketer of video games, you would want to know which sort of lifestyle category they fall into related to video game playing. Therefore, you might generate a series of questions about the types of games a particular male adult 18 to 34 played, the amount of money and the frequency with which they played those games, how they play those games. Are they social games? Do they play by themselves? Finally, we may also measure how what their motivations are for participating in games. If they are highly competitive, they may compete in tournaments, whereas if they are more social and interactive, they may be playing for friendship and camaraderie. In fact, once we recognize that different gamers engage in entirely different lifestyles related to gaming, we may quickly realize that age and gender are really irrelevant variables to understand this market entirely. For example, consider what the company Newzoo, uh, a company that specializes in video game markets and insights, uh, has generated. Based on their internal research, they have developed eight different gamer segmentation profiles. Each one of these eight profiles of video game players represents a type of mindset, style, and types of games that they play and participate in. A marketer in the video game industry clearly would want, would want to identify which one of these segment lifestyles is most relevant for their particular game, and which tertiary 
gamer segments are, are relevant for them as well. So I think by way of example here, we've illustrated some of the key uses of personality and lifestyle data. Marketing practitioners tend to treat personality and lifestyle characteristics for individuals as, as essentially fixed. Of course, people's lifestyles and their personalities can evolve over time, but in the small snapshot of time that a marketer might be thinking about utilizing this information, we treat these as sort of inherent traits of the individual. So this type of information is very useful for high resolution market segmentation. And that was illustrated clearly through the video game example previously. By knowing in the traits of someone's personality and their lifestyle, this provides much more useful and deeper insights beyond mere demographics that allow marketers have a better understanding how they may want to shape the tone and the content of their marketing communications based on someone's personality, for example, how to position a brand to align with a target market. So for example, individuals who are extremely outgoing, extremely extroverted, we may expect uh, a brand trying to reach that same audience to position itself to be also perceived as outgoing and extroverted. 